Where is the risk in today's financial markets? U.S. mortgages? Probably not. An overvalued U.S. stock market? Maybe. The U.K. bond market? Really? Actually, it just might be, to a point. This is the core risk of the modern world, and it's a story as old as humanity, but we have to suffer with the consequences. And these are the consequences. In this era of global inflation and unprecedented interest rate hikes by central banks, cracks in the global financial system are starting to form. Flare-ups of risk around the globe are getting investor attention with the UK bond market being the most recent example, but probably not the last. On this week's Global Macro Update, I speak with Ben Hunt of the website EpsilonTheory.com. We'll discuss what happened in the UK, why you should care, and how Wall Street's creative ways of applying more and more leverage to the financial system could once again trigger a crisis. I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics, and this is Global Macro Update. Ben Hunt from EpsilonTheory.com. It is so good to see you. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you taking some time today. It's my pleasure, Ed. Really, really great to be here. Well, Ben, this piece that you wrote recently on your website, I just, I think it's so important that I had to get you on, <laughs> on this program. It's funny, I, I was uh, reading it at my, at my kitchen counter, chatting with my wife, and uh she said, I don't know what happened to you. All of a sudden, your eyes glazed <laughs> over. You picked your computer up and you walked away and you disappeared for 20 minutes. Uh, it, it just grabbed a hold of me. Well, and it thank kind you. of, <laughs> but before we get too deep into it, I just, you know, I just want to say something. It's, it, it, it sort of gets at the real question that I think everyone around the world is asking themselves, and that is where is the risk? You know, I, I, I get on financial media every day, like most of us probably do, whether it's Bloomberg or CNBC or Fox Business, whatever. But almost every day, what we hear is something uh, about the U.S. mortgage and housing market mm -hmm. and how it's different today. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of equity in housing. And so housing is not going to blow up. Don't worry. And the implication is everything's fine. But I think everyone sort of has this, this gut feeling that everything is not fine, <laughs> that there's something wrong, and we're trying to find out the risk. And you, you really did a great job of illuminating where some of the risk might be, and that was ironically with the UK bond market. Is the UK bond market a threat to the global financial system? <laughs> it is. I mean, it's large enough that it is. So the, uh, you know, it's the, the the bond market, and in particular, it's the pension funds that are immersed in that bond market. And, and it's it's a lot of money. It's about 1.8 trillion dollars, right? So to make the conversion, it's about 1.8 trillion dollars, and that's that's real money, mm -hmm. uh, even even today. I will say though, we had I, can you know the the UK pension world blow up the rest of the world I, I mean it can be a it can be a bear stearns like event for sure it can be a long-term right. capital management event for some of your listeners and viewers who, who, who go back that far the real issue to me though ed you ask you know where is the risk the risk comes from a global repricing on interest rates We've had 30 plus years of artificially depressed interest rates. The price of money has been too low and intentionally so, specifically over the last 12 years. It's really been artificially pushed down and now the price of money is coming up. It's coming up fast, it's being led by the United States and that creates a wrecking ball around the world in terms of the US dollar and just in terms of well, what is the price of money today? It does create risk, even here in the United States, risk that goes well beyond the UK pension funds because the UK pension funds and the, and the problem they've built for themselves, it's most pronounced for them, but it exists everywhere. It definitely exists in the United States. And that core problem is this, and we can go into all the the whys and wherefores, but the problem is this. 
over the last decade for sure, and it really goes back a little bit longer than that, pension funds and any big asset manager, a lot of big family offices, a lot of big foundations and endowments. It's not that they've invested in hedge funds. That's actually fine, I think. Right. It's that they've started to manage themselves like a hedge fund, and that's not fine. So we can talk about that. I think that's the real source of risk I see, is that foundations, endowments, pension funds in the U.S., definitely in the U.K., have become hedge funds themselves in the way that they invest at the instigation of Wall Street, of course. And it's that combined with this global repricing of interest rates, of the price of money, that's where I think we need to look for the potential risk in the world. And those UK pension funds, they're the canary in the coal mine. So you did a great job with this article of really starting from the, the basics and, and bringing people right through to what is actually a pretty sophisticated, uh, complex problem and, and making people understand why they should care. So I want to make sure I do the same thing here. Good. I, you know, I, I have a feeling there aren't too many Americans, at least, laying awake at night worrying about the bond market. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, but, but they should but is, they should. is kind of the point here. Right. Exactly. So, so let me just give you some, some statistics that I, that I pulled today for, for this interview. This is uh, Federal Reserve Board data from 2021. And we're looking at total liquid assets held by U.S. households. I'm going to use real rough numbers here. Almost half of that is in stocks. Yep. Okay. Sense. Then you've got about 24% in the bank savings, um, about 20% in mutual funds. There's only 8.4% in bonds of pretty much all types. Hmm. So... U.S. Treasury securities, muni bonds, money markets, uh, corporate bonds, MBS, uh, uh, other types of bonds. Only 8.4%. That's, that's liquid assets owned by U.S. households. Okay, so right there, bonds, not something that too many people are invested yeah, in at the exactly. individual level. Exactly. And, and then when we go to retirement assets in this in this country it's just the US 45.8 trillion and pensions account for about 32 trillion of that so again it, it, it i i say that to just say what's the this problem is the thing that no one's worried about right but the last financial crisis it 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 blessed us with so many fun wall street acronyms uh, MBS, CMBS, CDOs, CDSs, uh, pick, pick three letters, put them together, and Wall Street would give it a name, right? You, you have a new one for us that I'd never heard, LDI. What is that and why should we care? Well, let's start with all those three-letter investment sure. products, right? What do they all have in common? What they all have in common is that they are an idea presented by Wall Street to someone who's got money. That's it. That's all they are. Every one of those acronyms you, you, you mentioned, and we can go by, you know, we can go into what they specifically are. But what they have in common is that it was an idea dreamed up in Wall Street to say, how do we get flow? Meaning, how do we get the, the, the person or the institution with money to buy this thing that we are offering? Because that's, that's what Wall Street is. And this goes back, this is a point in my article, this goes back way before there was a thing called Wall, called Wall Street. This goes back right. before there were things called streets. <laughs> this, right. is, right. this is the invention of the financial transaction world. And the financial tra transaction world exists to do two things and two things only. The first thing, I'll call it Wall Street because that's what we call it today. Right? And in the UK, 
the version of Wall Street is pension consultants, right? That's the that's the the the, the arm of Wall Street that we'll be talking about here. Okay. But all of what we're talking about Wall Street exists to do two things. The first is to turn a business operation into a piece of paper that can be exchanged from one person to another. We call that securitization. That's all it is, right? It's to take something, some debt you have, some ownership promise you have, we'll call that equity. Everything that Wall Street does is designed to take ownership promises, equity, turn that into stocks, take debt promises, turn that into bonds, and all those acronyms you just mentioned, they're just variations on that theme. It's a different way to turn something like a mortgage into an MBS, mortgage-backed security, that can be bought and sold and traded, and that's what Wall Street does. Sure. That's the first thing that Wall Street does. The second thing that Wall Street does, and all of financial innovation, all of it, is one of these two things. It's either securitization or it's leverage. And leverage is just a $10 word for borrowed money. That's it. All of Wall Street, all of those acronyms you just mentioned are variations on those two things. Mm -hmm. How can we get people to borrow money? And how can we securitize something so that this thing, this business interest or promise can be bought and sold between multiple people? That's it. And the acronym we're talking about today, LDI, Liability Driven Investment, it's just another one of those things, right? It's a combination of securitizing something and applying leverage to that something. And Ed, let me tell you, you know, this is, this is the core risk of the modern world, that we have so much borrowed money sloshing around the world, trillions, trillions, a quadrillion dollars worth of borrowed money sloshing around the world, that when every central bank, when globally we are raising the price of borrowed money, that's what's causing all the stress, Ed, that's it. And those UK pension funds, through a series of events, like say they're the canary in the coal mine, but the problem with our coal mine doesn't go away just if they find a Band-Aid to tide over the UK pension funds. So if right. you like, we can talk about what happened to the UK pension funds. And again, with just very simple, basic words, because you're right, it's complex, but it's not complicated. People love to use complicated words and jargon, but it's just hiding some very basic things that are happening here. And there are things that I think we all need to know about. Well, I think one of the things that I, you know, one of the questions that I had in my mind reading your article, and you addressed it in your article, mm -hmm. but reading through and, 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 and the argument makes a lot of sense. And I'm thinking to myself, is this a problem in the United States? Uh, does the 800 pound gorilla have, have this issue? Yeah. And uh, you, you indicated that it didn't. So it, it might make some sense. Well, let me, let me qualify that. The problem is the same. U.S. pension funds have turned themselves into hedge funds, <laughs> right? right. Okay. The problem is not as acute as it is in the U.K. because the United States, we have certain, I'll say, advantages. The advantages being that the Wall Street hedge fund program that we're using in the United States is a slightly less dangerous concoction <laughs> right, than what the UK is doing. It doesn't mean, okay. though, that it's not a Wall Street concoction that <laughs> could, could really go awry and will, frankly, is my view. But it's, it's a little less dangerous. And, and we can talk about what's less dangerous, but it's the same problem. Well, maybe what we should do is talk about kind of the, the core issue here, which is the repricing of, of money. Yep, exactly. Um, we, for years, 
including probably you, certainly me, John Malden, mm -hmm. uh, lots of people, friends, mutual friends, have been on the Fed to raise rates. Yep, absolutely, for sure. For, 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 for you, right? So, yep. and now they are. Yep. And so I think it can be really confusing for somebody to say, to, to come into this, uh, maybe somebody doesn't live it and breathe it every day, and say, what's the problem? You, you guys have been saying the Fed's been, oh. been neglect, now they're raising rates, and all of a sudden it's a problem. So can, can you maybe explain sure. how it becomes a problem? Sure. And, and by the way, just because it's a problem doesn't mean that the Fed shouldn't be raising rates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, look, the, we, we should have been at a baseline, a normalized interest rate of three and a half percent, you know, years 10, ago. Years ago? Right. 10 years ago, 10 years ago. And look, what, what happened was, and this is this happens all the time in human history, is that emergency government action around the great financial crisis, March of 2009, the Fed says, you know, we've got rates down at zero and now we're going to start buying stuff as well. Look, I think that, and we can talk about how this played out in the UK since too, I think that's what central banks are there for. They are the buyer of last resort. They are there, they were designed that when the rest of the world is too scared to buy anything. Central banks come in and they buy. And that's what they did in March 2009. I think it saved the world. The problem, Agreed. though, is that emergency government action becomes permanent government policy. <laughs> QE1 was not the problem. It was QE2 and QE3 and QE, QE infinity. It was keep interest rates at ZERP, zero interest rate policy, Forever and ever, amen. And it's a story as old as humanity, but we have to suffer with the consequences. And these are the consequences, right? Is that when interest rates go up, <laughs> it should go up. <laughs> About time. But because of the way that our money has been managed, and I'm calling it managed as opposed to be to stewarded, right? So that the managers of these pension funds, because of the situation of the last 12 years and below that the last 30 years, they've managed the fund now in such a way, I say they've become hedge funds. They've managed for short term, mm -hmm. they've used leverage and you combine those two things, it blows up their long-term liabilities. And that's, that's the tragedy of this, and it's why the central bank stepped in in the UK to try to keep these pension funds from becoming illiquid. And that's, that's, that's I don't know how to say this in kind of simpler terms, so I'm just gonna say it. The issue with banks and the issue with pension funds is never that they are insolvent. It's never for a pension fund that it is underfunded. What underfunded means is they have liabilities way out 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and they have the present value of their assets and they can try to project out. Do you have enough assets to cover your liabilities over the next 30 years? And if you don't, the pension fund is underfunded. You're insolvent. And that's not a good thing. But it's not the end of the world for a pension fund. What pension fund managers have done is that they have taken on all of these investment programs, these hedge fund programs like LDI that create short-term obligations because you're using leverage, you're using borrowed money, you're making a bet with another bank. So that you, a pension fund, who should be the epitome of a long-term investor, I just need to, to, to husband these assets so I can pay people off in 30 years in retirement. They get margin called. <laughs> yeah. mean, that It's insane, the bet goes against them, a bet they made because it makes them look good to their board of directors when times are normal. And this is what I mean by they've become managers rather than stewards. At the 
whisper at the, at the suggestion of Wall Street. And again, it's a time as old as human history, but we have to recognize it and we have to, I think, both protect ourselves and insist that the managers of our pension funds the foundations and endowments, the family offices that we might have a connection with, we all need to realize, hey, we've gone down this path of turning ourselves into these Wall Street influenced hedge funds. We got to back away with that before what happened in the UK happens over here in the US. Ben, let me, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Sure. I'm, I'm a pension fund manager. And I am sitting in an environment where uh, long-term bonds are paying 3%, say. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, got, I've got a mandate to earn 7% per year to, 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 to honor obligations I have 20 years out. Like, who, whose fault is that? I, well, I'll, I'll tell you right now whose fault it is. It's the fault of the board right? The, 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 the ultimate say-so over, you know, what you got to do as a pension fund to say that that is realistic, right? The, the solution on the long term is you've got to increase your funding. It's just very unpopular to say that. Right. <laughs> right? So right? it's a political, it's a political issue. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I have a lot of sympathy for pension fund managers. Some of my best friends are pension fund managers, right? right. I've got a ton of sympathy for them. It's a tough job because of the political pressure here. You say, well, I, I, I got to make 7%. How do I make 7% safely? Right. And the answer, the answer historically has always been, oh, you buy long-term bonds because they pay a decent interest rate. That's one of the differences, frankly, between the U.S. and the, and the U.K. The U.S. long-term bond market, like 30-year bonds, it's much deeper then well, we call them gilts over in the UK, right? What we call treasuries over here in the US, we call them gilts over there in the UK. That 30 year gilt market, it's actually very thin. So you've got all these pension funds falling over themselves to buy those 30 year gilts, and which pushes the price down, I'm sorry, pushes the price up and the rates down. Okay. Right? So I'm not saying that they had a easy row to hoe, Right, but I'm saying is that the solution that everyone has come up with, the solution that Wall Street offered, was to say, "Hey, let's turn you into a very short-term investor, because this will allow you to borrow and to hedge your liability, to hedge that long-term liability." Because mm -hmm. here's the math, and it's just very simple math, that when interest rates go down, the value of the promises you've made in the future, that goes up. Now that's bad news for a pension fund because they've made promises to the pensioners in the future, these long-term promises we call liabilities. So as interest rates have gone down over the last 30 years and really gone down over the last 12 years, the, the value of these liabilities, the negative for a pension fund manager, yeah. that's gone up and up. So Wall Street came to them and said, we have a great solution for you. We can hedge that bet for you. We can set up, it won't cost you a lot of money to set up the bet because you know we're gonna do it with, with, with leverage. We're gonna do it with what's called an interest rate swap. A swap is just a name for a bet. It's like putting okay. a bet on the football game. You're gonna have a winner and you're gonna have a loser. And so this, this bet is going to be that let's bet on interest rates continuing to go down. It's worked for the last 30 years, and that's what the pension fund consultants, that's what Wall Street will show you. They'll show you the math. They'll use words like value at risk. They'll, they'll show you the math that proves, man, this works. Over the last 30 years, it's worked. You can't lose. The math shows it, and you'll nod your head because who are you to argue with the math of the last 30 years? That the math of the last 30 years has been the math of interest rates going down. And what we are enduring today is these interest rates going back up. 
and the math breaks. So that bet that you took on with the bank, you're betting that, oh, interest rates will continue to go down. It went against you and it went against you fast. And you don't have the cash to cover it. And you get the email that says, hey, this swap went against you. I mean, I run a hedge fund. We get these, these emails. That's, sure. that's our business is you mm -hmm. get an email. The other side of the swap says, um, all right, you owe us money. Um, pay me now, today. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have until the end of the day to pay me what you owe on this bet. And in theory, Ben, I mean, having a hedge is not a bad, that it's not the hedge that's the problem. It's the fact that they bought this product and then borrowed, what, 90% of the premium to buy the product? There you have it, Ed. There you have it. And frankly, that's another difference between the UK and the US. In the US, there are securities, again, that Wall Street word, right? that where you can do this sort of hedging, where you can actually own the asset. You buy what's called a treasury strip, where so you're actually buying the thing that's going to hedge your portfolio. Okay. So it's not this kind of direct, I'm making a bet, like an interest rate swap is. Now, again, it's just a slightly less toxic concoction that Wall Street is serving you, but it is less toxic in that makes a difference. It provides time so that we can, you know, the pension fund managers over here can write their ship before things get really squirrely over here too. But it only buys you time. It's the same toxic concoction, just not quite as poisonous as they've had to drink over in the UK. I know you're going to be writing about this more in the future. Do you care to speculate, if you will, on where else the risk may lie? I mean, sure. who, who, who owns the most bonds? I, my guess is it would be pension funds and banks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely the pension funds because these long-term bonds are their natural asset for their long-term liabilities. It was became a very specific problem in the UK because they had a government that did unfunded tax cuts. They had to deal with the Fed rising, you know, hiking interest rates faster than the Bank of England. All of these things came together to create a situation where there were no buyers for these bonds and the Bank of England had to step in or else these pension funds would not have been able to make their margin call. You ask where this goes from here. What we're dealing with today is a global margin call. So every asset owner, again, that's a big fancy word for every family office, every pension fund, every foundation and endowment, they've all been infected by Wall Street. Some have been infected a little, some have been infected a lot. The ones that have been infected a lot and the ones that are in countries outside of the US where they don't have the dollar, they're getting margin calls. Okay. And that could be a corporate treasury, <laughs> right? Right? That could any it could be anything. But those are the questions you need to ask of whatever that means to you, right? For for whatever asset owners mean to you. One other thing to mention, I mentioned the US dollar. What brings this here? in spades is if the US dollar cracks. What could do that? My view is domestic political strife. I think that's mm. what could damage the US dollar. Does that happen uh, through the midterms? I kind of doubt it. Does that happen going into 2024 where we have real domestic political conflict and a, frankly a constitutional crisis? I think there's a non-trivial chance of that happening. So that's kind of the big picture for me. For the U.S., this gets really serious if something happens to the dollar. And how does something happen to the dollar? <laughs> I 
I think it happens if we do it to ourselves internally. Ben Hunt from Epsilon Theory. I want to make sure I get the name of this article right here. It's A Brief History of the Past 10,000 Years of Monetary Policy and Why Last Week Was a Big Deal. The article is not nearly as intimidating as the title. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was so important. If you're watching this and you've stayed with us, you definitely go to EpsilonTheory.com and read this important article and, and stay with Ben and, and follow him. Ben, as always, uh, it's just so fascinating speaking with you. I really appreciate your time. Great to be here, Ed. Thank you. Thanks for watching this week's Global Macro Update from Malden Economics. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory. If you did, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and smash that like button. It always helps us out. If you would like to get an email every week with a summary of a global macro update and a transcript of the most recent interview that we've had, along with a link to the video. You can just go to the link in the description below and enter your email address, no strings attached, to get global macro updates sent to you each and every Friday morning. I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. Thanks for watching.